Hi learners, it's M from Sound of Nerds, and this video is on transducer anatomy. Unit 8, transducer anatomy. A transducer is any device that changes one form of energy into another. There are tons of examples of transducers in everyday life, like an engine takes in gas or chemical energy and then converts it into kinetic or motion energy. Light bulbs take electrical energy and convert the energy into light and some heat. Our bodies can even act like transducers. The muscles can take chemical energy and change it into motion. The transducers that are part of an ultrasound system are special kinds of transducers. They are considered bidirectional. All those previous examples show energy conversion that only happened in one direction. Here's a drawing of a basic transducer. To better understand the very complex transducers used with the modern ultrasound system, we can begin by deconstructing a simple single element transducer. In a single element transducer, the PCT is disc shaped. We're gonna learn more about each piece in the next sections. Section 8.1, PCT element. The ultrasound transducer is capable of changing electrical energy into sound and sound energy into electrical. The part of the transducer that is responsible for the bi-directional conversion is called the piezoelectric element. The act of turning sound, which are pressure waves, into electrical volts is called the piezoelectric effect. The piezoelectric effect occurs during reception, when echoes are coming back from the body. So during reception, the piezoelectric element will change shape when sound pressure is applied. The shape change produces the electrical voltage, and this is the piezoelectric effect. A material changing shape, creating a voltage. Recall that sound is a mechanical wave, which is also known as a pressure wave. And when that sound is coming back from the body, it interacts with the piezoelectric material to produce that voltage. And then that voltage is sent to the machine to be processed and turned into an ultrasound image. The act of turning electrical volts into sound waves is called the reverse piezoelectric effect. The reverse piezoelectric effect occurs during transmission, and that is when the transducer is emitting sound waves into the body. So during transmission, the piezoelectric material is going to receive a voltage that's applied from the machine. That voltage is going to change the shape of the piezoelectric material, and then a sound wave is produced. The reverse piezoelectric effect is voltage to sound, where the normal piezoelectric effect is sound to voltage. It's going to be very important that you remember when the piezoelectric effect occurs and when reverse piezoelectric effect occurs. As sonographers, we get to see the piezoelectric effect happen all the time because that's our job, that's what's happening in the machine, so we can create our ultrasound waves. But there's actually this really cool thing that you can even try on your own. Lifesavers makes a lifesaver, the wintergreen lifesavers, and they have these little crystally pieces within the lifesaver that when you chew on them, create the piezoelectric effect. The pressure of you chewing on these crystals creates a voltage. So sometimes you can see a little spark if you're in the dark when you chew on these wintergreen lifesavers. So I actually have a little gift that I found on the internet here. In slow motion, they are destroying this lifesaver. And you can see this blue spark, that's the voltage. That's real, that's little, tiny little bit of voltage that occurred from the pressure, condensing those crystals and creating a voltage because they are piezoelectric material. So just like piezoelectric material can occur in lifesavers, it actually does occur quite a bit in nature as well. So some examples of piezoelectric material, which is also known as ferroelectric material, is going to include quartz, topaz, cane sugar, and tourmaline. So as you can see, these are all mostly crystals. When these crystals are compressed, they will create an electric volt. That's the piezoelectric piece of it. And it would be fantastic if we could just take these elements from nature and turn them into crystals for our ultrasound machine. But as you can kind of see from these examples, these aren't perfect crystals. They have imperfections in them. And when that happens, we wouldn't be able to get pure sounds and predictable sounds from these materials. Therefore, we've got man-made materials that act as piezoelectric materials. The most common man-made material is called lead zirconate titanate, 
or abbreviated to PZT. Now you might be thinking, why PZT? If you think back to your table of elements, lead is represented by the letters PB, which stood for the Latin term plumbum. So lead is abbreviated P, Z, zinc for the zirconate, and T, titanium for the titanate. So lead, zirconate, titanate gets abbreviated to PZT crystal quite often. Problem with man-made materials though is that they do have some pitfalls. First off, when you make man-made materials, they're not naturally piezoelectric. So to make it piezoelectric, we're going to put the material in a magnetic field, and then we have to heat everything up to an extremely high temperature. By doing so, this creates kind of a magnetism within the material that will react to those voltages as they come down and the sound pressure waves. Now this might not seem initially like a pitfall, but the problem is, is if this man-made material, once it's been treated to have its piezoelectric properties, if this element is exposed to really high levels of heat after its construction, it's going to lose all of its piezoelectric properties. So this really high temperature has a name, it's called the curry point. Thankfully though, the curry point is extremely high, over 500 degrees Fahrenheit or about 300 degrees Celsius. And the odds of encountering these extreme temperatures during our everyday clinical use is extremely low. But it's still something to consider that these piezoelectric materials can lose their properties in the right conditions. Another pitfall of the man-made PZT material is that it has a very high impedance. Remember that means resistance to sound. So the PZT material has a high resistance to sound compared to the low impedance of skin. So the skin is more accepting of that sound wave. The problem is though, when we have that large of a mismatch, that means that less sound is actually going to enter into the body if we were just to put PZT crystal onto skin. So one of the ways that they kind of bring down the impedance level of the PZT is to mix it with a resin. And this piezo composite is made just right so we can improve the element's bandwidth, its sensitivity, and its resolution. So if we look at these images here, we can see that we have the PZT element, there's square in this bottom example here, and then they're encased in a resin. This is an example of more rectangular shaped. This is smaller rectangle shaped. And then these are even smaller. I believe these ones have been subdiced or broken down into little pieces that work together. So it's interesting to see what those materials look like when they're not inside of our transducer. However, whatever the material is made out of for ultrasound, we typically refer to the element as either PZT, the ceramic, active element, or crystal. So you'll hear a lot of different terms to describe the actual, so you'll hear a lot of different terms describing the actual piece of the transducer that is creating the sound waves. So let's take a little bit of a closer look at how the PZT crystal actually creates the frequency. First thing we need to know is that at least one element is needed to create a 2D image or a pulsed wave. However, most of our transducers do have hundreds of crystals at the transducer face. Contrary to this then, continuous wave transducers need at least two elements. One is always transmitting, one is always receiving. Either way though, each crystal is connected to a wire that connects back to the machine. When voltages come down the wire, they will cause the PZT crystal to resonate or change shape. The contraction and expansion of the material is what creates the sound wave. In this image, I've got a little diagram of what it looks like when the PZT crystal contracts and expands. So at rest, we have the PZT crystal here. The magnetic poles within it are just kind of chilling out. Nothing's really being applied. So this is the normal size of the element. As those voltages come down, one is going to be a negative voltage and the other is going to be a positive voltage. And those are applied to either side of the face. Now, if you remember back to magnets, the negative is attracted to positive and positive is attracted to negative. And because of that, it's going to kind of spin these atoms around. And by doing so, it kind of stretches them out, which causes the PZT crystal to expand. Another voltage is going to be applied then, and it's going to be the opposite. And when those voltages flip, the magnetic properties don't like being matched up with its own. They try to get away from it. And by doing so, it makes the whole PZT crystal compress. So we end up with something that kind of looks like this. We have a crystal that expands and contracts beyond its normal size. Those expansions and contractions create a pressure wave, which results as a sound wave or ultrasound wave into the body. Upon reception, then those sound waves are going to come back, cause the crystal to do the same thing, but this time it's going to cause a voltage then to head back to the machine. 
How does the PZT crystal affect the frequency then? Well, in continuous wave transducers, it's actually pretty easy. Whatever the electrical voltage frequency is that is produced by the machine is what the acoustic frequency is. So an electrical frequency of 3 MHz comes down the wire, interacts with the crystal, and a 3 MHz acoustic frequency is produced. So in the continuous wave transducer, the electrical frequency is equal to the acoustic frequency. Remember in continuous wave transducers that the wave is always being transmitted and received, and that these types of transducers do not produce images. Creating a frequency in a pulse wave transducer, however, is a little bit more complicated. So in the pulse wave transducer, the sound is pulsed, meaning that it has an off and on time. Remember that during those pulses, multiple PZT elements are going to be activated. The waves that are created are very small wavelets, remember Huygens waves, and these wavelets are going to construct and destruct, creating the propagating pulse. And instead of just getting a constant stream of voltages, the PZT crystals are getting blasts of voltages, so they create those pulses. So it's a little bit of voltage, pulse goes out. And then we have that PRP, a little bit of voltage, pulse goes out, and then we wait again. So it's with those kind of bursts of voltages, those pulsings, that we end up getting some different properties created by our PZT element. So in the pulse wave transducer, the frequency at which the PZT crystal resonates or expands and contracts at is based on two things. And it's going to be the thickness of the PZT crystal and the propagation speed of the PZT crystal. And we know this because the formula for the operating frequency of the transducer is related to the PZT element and that the frequency of the transducer is going to be equal to the speed in the element divided by 2 multiplied by the thickness of the element. Most of our PZT material has a propagation speed of about 4 to 6 millimeters per microsecond and the elements are going to range anywhere from 0.2 millimeters to about 1 millimeter thick. Let's take a look at the relationships that we can pull from this formula. The first one is that frequency and element thickness are going to be inversely related. Thicker elements create low frequencies and thinner elements are going to create higher frequencies. So a very thick element will give us that low frequency, long wavelengths, where our thin element will create a higher frequency with shorter wavelengths. So as thickness increases, the frequency is going to decrease. If we take a look at a couple examples by plugging in some numbers into our formula, let's take a look at this green one first. We see that the PZT element has a thickness of one millimeter. If we're given that this is a four millimeter per microsecond propagation speed, we'll plug our one millimeter in, and we can see that this transducer is going to produce a two megahertz frequency. Now let's jump over to the pink one, which only has a 0.2 millimeter thickness. Everything remains the same, except we're going to change the thickness of the PZT element, and we see that it creates a 10 megahertz frequency. So by plugging in some very basic numbers into our formula, we can see that as the thickness increases, the frequency is going to decrease, making them inversely related. Remember that we can also figure that out based on the formula, knowing that the denominator is going to be inversely related to the quotient. Another relationship that we can see from that formula is that frequency and propagation speed are going to be directly related. So slower propagation speeds are going to create lower frequencies, where fast propagation speeds are going to create higher frequencies. Again, we have a PZT crystal with a propagation speed of one millimeter per microsecond, versus our PZT crystal that has a 4 millimeter per microsecond. Our slow propagation speed, our low numerical value propagation speed is going to create the lower frequency, and the high propagation speed or higher numerical value propagation speed is going to create the high frequency. So if we plug in 1 millimeter per microsecond in our 0.2 millimeter thickness PZT crystal, we get a 2.5 megahertz frequency keeping everything the same, but changing to a four millimeter per microsecond propagation speed increases that frequency to 10 megahertz. So now we can see that when propagation speed increases, it's going to create a higher frequency, making these directly related. And again, we know this because the numerator is directly related to the quotient. Now, if we take a look at our operating frequency formula and a formula that we learned way back where wavelength is equal to the propagation speed divided by the frequency, 
we can kind of combine these together. And what we end up seeing is that the thickness of the PCT crystal is equal to half of the wavelength. So this again tells us that as the frequency increases, we know that our wavelength is going to decrease. Therefore, our thickness is going to decrease because wavelength and thickness are going to be directly related. As far as math goes for any of these formulas, the biggest thing with frequency formula up here is to just know that the propagation speed is directly related to the frequency and the thickness is inversely related to the frequency. So if the thickness of the PZT crystal is doubled, then we'll see a doubling of the operational frequency. And as that PZT crystal gets thinner, we should see an increase in the frequency that it creates. The formula on the bottom here is going to be more likely the one that you may actually have to calculate. You may be given that the frequency of a wave is five millimeters. What is the thickness of the PZT crystal? You would know that five multiplied by half is 2.5. So you should be able to say that it is a 2.5 thick PZT crystal. So to summarize some of the main points of how pulsed wave PZT crystals affect the frequency of the transducer, we see that with high frequency transducers, we're going to see short wavelengths, thin PZT crystals, and faster PZT propagation speeds, where low frequency transducers are going to have longer wavelengths, thicker PZT crystals, and slower PZT propagation speeds. Continuous wave, remember, is our easy one, just the electrical frequency is going to be equal to the acoustic frequency. You will see in your workbook that I gave you three different scenarios in which you have been given frequencies and wavelengths and PZT crystal thicknesses, and you'll compare the two transducers to answer the question. I've also asked you to use a formula to prove why your answer is correct. So go ahead and work through those scenarios, and when you're ready, unpause the video and we'll go over the answers. So our first scenario tells us that transducer A has a propagation speed of 6 millimeters per microsecond and a thickness of 0.4 millimeters. Transducer B has a propagation speed of 3 millimeters per microsecond and a thickness of 0.4 millimeters. Based on this information, which transducer should have the higher frequency? Looking back, we can see that both PZT elements have the same thickness, 0.4 millimeters. So thickness is not what we are looking at. We're looking at the propagation speeds. One has a six millimeter per microsecond, the other has a three millimeter per microsecond. Knowing our formula and knowing the relationships that we pull from it, the higher the numerical value of propagation speed, the higher the frequency should be. So in this example, we can say that transducer A is going to have the higher frequency. On the bottom, you can see how I have plugged those numbers into our formula. We put in our six millimeters per microsecond over 2 multiplied by the thickness of the PZT element. Plug in that math and we get 7.5 megahertz frequency for transducer A. Transducer B ends up with a 3.75 megahertz. So we can see with increased propagation speed, we get an increased frequency. Lower propagation speed decreases the frequency. The next scenario says transducer A has a propagation speed of 6 millimeters per microsecond and a frequency of 12 megahertz. Transducer B has a propagation speed of 4 millimeters per microsecond and a frequency of 10 megahertz. Based on this information, which element will be thicker? For this example, the answer again is transducer A. And if you got to the math of this, awesome, because we did have to go through a couple extra steps on this one. The first thing we needed to figure out is what was the wavelength of the 12 megahertz transducer. And then secondly, we needed to use our thickness multiplied by half of the wavelength to figure out the thickness of the PZT element to be able to answer this question. So for transducer A, we took our six millimeters per microsecond and divided it by 12 megahertz. That gave us a wavelength of 0.5 millimeters multiplied by half and we see that we get a 0.25 millimeter thickness for transducer A. We can do the same thing then with transducer B, where we plugged in our four millimeters and divided by 10 megahertz to get a wavelength of 0.4. Multiply it by half, and we get a thickness of the PZT crystal at 0.2 millimeters. 0.25 millimeters is bigger than 0.2, so transducer A has the thicker element. So the element thickness is directly related to the wavelength. 
Our last scenario then says that transducer A has a propagation speed of 6 millimeters per microsecond and a thickness of 0.3 millimeters, where transducer B has a propagation speed of 6 millimeters per microsecond and a thickness of 0.8 millimeters. Based on this information, which will have the higher frequency? So now we have the exact same propagation speed in our transducers, but we have different thicknesses of the PZT element. And we know that the thickness of the PCT element is inversely related to the frequency it produces. So the thinner element should be the one that creates the higher frequency. Transducer A at 0.3 millimeters is thinner than 0.8 millimeters. So again, the answer is transducer A. And if we plug in our numbers to our formula, again, look, we have six millimeters per microsecond propagation speed on top divided by 2 multiplied by the thickness. We're going to do the same thing for transducer B, and we see that when we decrease the size of the element, we are increasing the transducer frequency. They are inversely related. Next in our transducer anatomy tour, we are going to talk about the matching layer in section 8.2. So referring back to our image here, we have the matching layer is the very front part of the transducer sits in between the PZT and the patient. So the matching layer is going to be used to direct sound into the body by being an impedance between the element and the skin. The matching layer is related to the transducer frequency. So the matching layer is going to help to transmit the sound into the body by kind of being a middle impedance. And that's going to be compared to the element and the skin. The impedance value of a PZT is more than 20 times that of skin. And when we have that really large mismatch, a lot of reflection is going to occur. Very little sound is actually going to make it into the body. If we were just to place a PZT crystal directly onto the skin, I think we'd get something like 80% reflection and only 20% of the sound actually making it into the body to create those echoes. So by putting the matching layer in between, we are going to reduce that mismatch, encouraging more sound to travel into the body. So without that matching layer, very little sound would actually make it into the body. And to provide sufficient balance to the PZT, the matching layer ends up being one quarter the thickness of the wavelength. So remember that PZT is half of the wavelength. Matching layer is a quarter of the wavelength. So that means that as the frequency increases, the wavelength is going to decrease. And when the wavelength decreases, the thickness of the PZT and the thickness of the matching layer are also both going to decrease. So thinner wavelengths mean thinner PZT crystals, thinner matching layers. So at the transducer face, we have the PZT crystal and the matching layer sits in front of it. Now the matching layer in a lot of transducers is actually more than one layer. These are going to be very, very thin pieces of matching material that are going to equate to the quarter wavelength, but each layer is meant to kind of act like a step down in impedance values to create an easier transition to the skin. So we might see one, two, or three layers to that matching layer to step the impedance values down. So the matching layer has a giant job to do to help get that sound directed into the body so we don't have too much reflection once the sound wave hits the skin. But another thing that we're going to need in between the transducer and the skin is something called gel or the coupling medium. Now the gel is water-based, so it shouldn't cause much, if any, attenuation. And it's going to further reduce the impedance mismatch between the transducer and the skin. The other thing the gel does is also eliminates the scattering that even a thin layer of air would cause. In these images on the top one, we see that we have an image being produced with no gel, and then what it would look like with that gel present. To summarize then, in decreasing order of impedance is the PZT crystal, which has a higher impedance than the matching layer, matching layers, which has a higher impedance than the gel, which has a higher impedance than the skin. Remember, we're trying to step down the impedances, so we reduce the mismatch therefore encouraging more transmission of sound energy into the body. Next up, we're going to talk about backing material in section 8.3. The backing material sits behind the PZT crystal, 
and in the body of the transducer. The vacuum material in this image is represented by this yellow part. Vacuum material, which is also known as dampening material, is in direct contact with the PZT elements. The vacuum material is often made of a resin, which is going to be mixed with a metallic powder or filaments, usually made of tungsten. The vacuum material is going to keep the PZT material from ringing for too long by reducing the number of cycles in each pulse. So recall that when we create a pulse, there are going to be a number of cycles within that pulse, and the fewer cycles that we have in the pulse is going to create better, more detailed images. And that's because the spatial pulse length, or the SPL, increases with the more cycles that the pulse contains. So if the PZT crystal is allowed to ring, it will add more cycles to a pulse, and long SPLs degrade the quality of the image. Therefore, we want that backing material in our imaging transducers to keep the pulses short and improve our resolution. When backing material is added to a transducer, we want the acoustic impedance of the backing material to be very similar to the PZT impedance. When you have similar impedances, the sound is more likely to travel through it versus being reflected. So if that backing material matches the impedance of the PZT material, then we are going to expect more transmission to occur through it, therefore encouraging that sound energy to come into the backing material versus being expressed in a longer pulse. So that backing material is going to help create very short pulses. To match the impedance of the PCT crystal, most dampening material is made of an epoxy resin that has tungsten filaments throughout it. Now, adding backing material to transducers does have some consequences, but they're not all bad. The first one is that it can decrease sensitivity, meaning that it could cause the transducer to miss very low amplitude reflectors. Another consequence is that it can cause a wide bandwidth. And thirdly, it can cause a lower quality factor. Our first consequence told us that backing material decreases an ultrasound system's sensitivity. Sensitivity is the machine's ability to process and display weak echoes. When sound waves come back to the transducer, they've attenuated quite a bit, so they are very weak. They still need to interact with the PCT material to create the electrical voltage that will become the image. Now that dampening material is going to shorten the PCT element's reaction time in both transmission and reception. So that means it's going to cause it to not contract and expand as long. So those very weak echoes that are coming back are going to be even weaker due to the backing material. And this might weaken them to the point that they're not even detectable anymore. So here we have two transducers receiving echoes coming back. So those receiving echoes are going to interact with the PZT element and some of that sound energy gets directed into the backing material. Now if there's a lot of backing material, that's kind of where it ends. It's going to get stuck in there. That voltage is never going to make it to the wire to make it back to the machine. However, if we have weaker echoes coming back into a transducer with just a little bit of backing material or no backing material, that sound wave is going to interact with the PZT element and a lot of that sound energy is still going to make it into the wire to go back to the machine. So our dampening material reduces the sensitivity to those really weak echoes that are coming back because it's gonna make it just a little bit weaker before the machine even gets the signal. Our second consequence is that backing material increases the transducer's bandwidth. Now the bandwidth is the range of useful frequencies that a device can operate at. So many imaging transducers can operate at multiple frequencies. And the bandwidth is the highest frequency minus the lowest frequency. In this image, we have how bandwidths are typically depicted in graphical form. So we have kind of our operating frequency, the frequency that the PCT element likes to operate at, where it kind of naturally resonates. And then we have a frequency that's very low that the PCT crystal can create, and we have frequencies that are higher that the PCT crystal can create. So we see that the bandwidth is the highest frequency minus the lowest frequency that a transducer can create. So to calculate bandwidth, we are going to take the maximum frequency and subtract the minimum frequency. In this transducer on top here, we see that we have transducer A, which can produce 
frequencies up to 12 megahertz and down to 3 megahertz. This transducer has a bandwidth of 9 megahertz. This is actually very wide. It has a very wide range of frequencies that it can produce. The resonant frequency, which is also known as the operational frequency, is typically the middle of that, which for transducer A is around 7.5 megahertz. Compare these values then to transducer B, which has a frequency range of 5 megahertz to 3 megahertz. 5 minus 3 is a 2 megahertz bandwidth, which would be considered narrow. And that is because it has a low variation from its resonant frequency. The resonant frequency, again, is kind of the middle of the road of the frequencies that it can produce. So for transducer B, it is 4 megahertz. When sound is created, it can do one of two things. We can let it ring freely, or we can dampen it. So if we allow sound to ring freely without any restriction, it's going to ring at a very pure frequency. Think about plucking a guitar string or hitting a key on a piano. If you just hit it, you'll get the tone intended. But if you dampen the sound or cause it so it can't resonate freely, it's going to create other frequencies within it. And that is one of the ideas behind bandwidth. If we let the PZT crystal ring for a long time without that dampening material, it's going to create a very pure frequency. If we put that backing material on there, it's going to cause the PZT crystal to not resonate as freely, and when it does, it's going to cause a lot of frequencies as its resonation is dampened. Another thing to consider when sound is created, if we allow it to resonate freely without restriction, it can create a sound wave that has a lot of cycles within it. When we begin to dampen how the sound wave resonates, it is going to shorten the amount of cycles created. And both of these are side effects of having that dampening material there. We're going to get dampened sound waves that are going to create more frequencies, which create the bandwidth, and we're going to see that the cycles are shortened. We can kind of relate this to how a bell rings. Given the opportunity, it could ding for a really long time. If we put a little bit of dampening on, we might get a little bit less ring, it might just be a ding. And if we put a lot of dampening on, we'll barely get her any ring at all. We might hear something like ding. I found my small replica of the Liberty Bell and thought I would try this to show you. So let's take a listen. See if you can tell which one has no dampening, just a little bit of dampening, and the most dampening. Were you able to figure it out? Let's listen one more time. These first two are going to be free ringing. The second one has just a little bit of dampening. And the last one has a lot. So if we compare these sounds of the bell to our transducer, when we ring the PZT crystals without dampening material, they ring for a very long time at a pure frequency. When we introduce that dampening material, or somehow dampen how the PZT crystals resonate, we are going to start to hear more of like a little click sound out of the PZT crystals, and that little click is going to hold a lot of frequencies, thus creating a wider bandwidth. So by adding that dampening material to the transducer, we are achieving two improvements for ultrasound imaging. We are creating a wide bandwidth and short pulses. And for imaging transducers, we see that wide bandwidths offer more flexibility. We can use those higher frequencies in the bandwidth to create images on thinner patients or get more detailed images, where we can then use those low frequencies within the bandwidth to create images on larger patients, or we can use it for Doppler, because remember, Rayleigh scattering increases with higher frequencies. So we want to use lower frequencies when we use Doppler imaging. In modern machines, the machines are capable of using the frequencies on their own, or it can combine all those frequencies within the bandwidth to create optimized parts of an image. And as we've mentioned a few times, fewer pulses are going to be good as well because they improve the detail resolution. Fewer pulses mean shorter spatial pulse lengths, and the shorter the pulse length, the more axial resolution that can be achieved. And with improved axial resolution, we see more detail. So in our continuous wave transducers, we typically do not put any backing material in them. They are not imaging transducers, so we're not looking to increase any detail 
in our pictures because we can't get them anyway. So continuous wave transducers typically don't have any vacuum material. What we see then is that they ring at a very pure frequency. They're going to have a lot in, in continuous wave infinite cycles. And this is going to create a very narrow bandwidth. Compare that then to a pulse wave transducer that has just a little bit of backing material. We're going to see that the pulse still has a lot of cycles in it, but it has a definite end because it is a pulsed wave. This is going to create a wider bandwidth than a continuous wave transducer, but it'll be narrower than a bandwidth with a transducer that has more backing material. This is kind of like the middle bell ringing that we heard. So this transducer is going to have poor detail resolution because it has a little bit longer pulses than what we would want, but it'll still be more sensitive to those returning echoes. Lastly, we can compare all these to a pulse wave transducer that has a lot of backing material. This backing material is basically going to cause the PZT crystals to create a click. And within that click, we are going to see very few cycles and multiple frequencies. That multiple frequency creation makes for a wider bandwidth. And the very short click and the fewer cycles results in a short spatial pulse length, which creates superior detail and resolution. So backing material is good for our images because it creates more frequencies, higher bandwidth, short cycles, shorter SPL, better detail resolution. The third consequence that we learned about is that backing material will reduce the quality factor. Now the quality factor is a unitless number that is inversely related to bandwidth. And I want to point out that it is very important that when you're talking about quality factor, you're talking about the quality of the tone produced by the transducer, not the quality of the image. So when we say something has a high Q factor, it means that it is a very pure tone, not that it is producing a very good image. In fact, low Q factor produce better ultrasound images. Let's take a look at examples showing how the Q factor is inversely related to the bandwidth. So when a wave has a high Q factor, it will have a narrow bandwidth. And that means that there is less variation from its operating frequency. So for example, let's say we have taken a sample from a wave that has an operating frequency of 1.5 Hertz. And if this was our sampling, we can see that there is a 1 hertz wave and a 2 hertz wave. And this is going to create a very narrow bandwidth because we can take 2, the maximum frequency, minus 1, the minimum frequency, and see that the bandwidth is 1 hertz. So this sound is actually very pure. If we had an operating frequency of 1.5, we're really only varying from the natural operating frequency by half a hertz either direction. So we have a very pure sound. To calculate the Q factor for this wave, we would want to use the formula for Q factor, which is the operating frequency of the wave divided by the bandwidth. So for this wave, we can calculate the Q factor to be 1.5, and that is because we have 1.5 hertz, the operating frequency, divided by 1 hertz, which gives us a Q factor, remember it's unitless, of 1.5. So the frequencies that are exhibited in this wave are very close to its operating frequency, which means it has a very high Q factor. It's high quality tone because it is very close to being a very pure tone. Now let's compare that to a wave that has lots of frequencies within it. So when we have low Q factor, it's usually due to a wide bandwidth. And that means that there is more variation from its operating frequency. So again, here we have an example of a wave, and let's say that this wave sample was taken from an operating frequency of 3.5 hertz. In this wave sample, we can see it has a 1 hertz, it actually has a 2, 3, 4, 5, and up to a 6 hertz, that red wave in the middle. So the bandwidth of this wave is very wide, because we are going to take 6, the maximum, minus 1, the minimum, to calculate a 5 hertz bandwidth. So this sound is not very pure. It has a lot of other frequencies within it. But we're still going to calculate the Q factor, and we're going to use that again using our formula, being the operating frequency divided by the bandwidth. And when we do that, we can calculate the Q factor for this wave to be 0 0.7. And that is because we took the operating frequency of 3.5 hertz, 
and divided it by the bandwidth. So we see that the frequencies that are within this wave are further from the operating frequency. There's more of them, and it means that it's going to have more tones and lower quality. So to summarize the consequences of adding backing material, which we typically find in our imaging or pulse wave transducers, let's compare imaging transducers to continuous wave transducers. In our imaging transducers, we will see that we have short pulses, dampened pulses, because of that backing material. With that backing material, we are going to see wider bandwidths and lower Q factors. And because of all of this, this type of transducer will have low sensitivity to returning echoes. Compare that then to the continuous wave transducer. Continuous wave transducers are typically going to have longer waves, undampened waves, there's going to be no backing material in them, and because of that no backing material, they're going to have very narrow bandwidths, which create high Q factor waves and create more sensitivity. Remember that calculating the bandwidth is as simple as taking the maximum frequency created by a transducer and subtracting the minimum frequency created by the transducer. That gives you your bandwidth. And then the Q factor is calculated by taking the natural operating frequency of a transducer and dividing it by the bandwidth. And this will remind us that Q factor and bandwidth are inversely related. Moving on to section 8.4, we'll talk about the wire. Now the wire in this image is going to travel through the cord and through the backing material to attach directly to the PZT crystal. In an ultrasound transducer, the wire connects the element to the ultrasound system and each PZT element has its own wire. So during transmission, a voltage travels down the wire to the PZT face, where it will cause the PZT to deform, and then the element to create the ultrasound wave. In reception, the wire is going to take the voltage produced from the PZT crystal by receiving that echo. It's going to take the voltage and return it back to the machine for processing. All the wires typically gather together at the base of the transducer and then run through the cord. So if a transducer has 250 elements on it, then 250 wires are running back through the cord. And as we'll learn in a few units, we need those individual wires because we are going to send electrical voltages in very specific patterns to the PZT elements to activate them in the way that we want. So that is why each PZT element is going to have its own wire. We need to communicate with each PZT crystal. So all those wires run through the cord, it's really important that we take care of the wire where it attaches to the transducer and make sure that we don't run over the cord with the machine. To finish up our transducer anatomy, we'll take a brief look at the housing of the transducer. The case of the transducer is the outer shell and it's typically going to be made of plastic or metal. Next in then we have the electrical shield and this is going to be a metal layer under the case. And this is going to help keep outside electrical interference from entering the transducer. Remember, we do have voltages coming down those wires. If we were to have some extra electrical information get into those wires, then we could really affect how the wires are creating a voltage on the PZT crystals, we can in turn produce electrical interference artifact in our images. The next layer in then is the acoustic insulator. And this is going to be a thin barrier of cork or rubber. And the whole point of it is to separate the internal components of the transducer from the case and the electrical shield. The point of the acoustic insulator is to absorb some of those vibrations that are coming back from the body during echoes. So those extra vibrations are not creating new vibrations on the PZT crystal that might be interpreted as sound waves. So the acoustic insulator absorbs those extra vibrations and keeps them from interfering with the true echoes that are returning. The outer portion of the transducer should be inspected for cracks or damage before every use. It's the housing that will protect the sonographer and the patient from electrical shock. The case of our transducer typically has a notch on the outside, and this will indicate which side of the transducer corresponds with the imaging sector. So for example, we have got a cardiac transducer here. The notch is over here. This notch indicates which side of the transducer face aligns with the probe orientation marker. So this part of the transducer is making 
this part of the image. Same idea on this one, we have the notch. This is indicating then that this part of the transducer face will create this side of the image moving over. Our notches on our transducers correspond with the probe orientation marker. You might notice on your transducer that there are other little notches and grooves on it as well. These are to attach a biopsy needle bracket to. So these, this is the bracket and attaches into these little grooves on either side of the transducer, and then you can put a needle in it to aid in the accuracy and repeatability of your biopsy. Now these little grooves and notches are actually very difficult to get gel out of, so you wanna make sure that you're double checking them to make sure that your transducer is nice and clean for your next patient. And speaking of cleaning the transducer, we need to make sure that we are cleaning the transducer after every patient. Typically that starts with using an approved wipe to clean off the gel and complete a low level disinfection. Low level disinfection is completely fine for the transducers that we use just across the body, no open sores or anything. Just wipe them down with a cloth, get all the extra gel off and then wipe them down with a disinfecting wipe. Any transducers that are inserted into a body cavity have been in contact with open wounds or have been used in a biopsy should undergo high level disinfection. Now high level disinfection is going to reduce the biological burden of microbes and viruses. Currently there are some fluid solutions like glutaraldehyde and orthophthalahyde or OPA that are used to soak the transducer. We've got a couple examples here of gust units. These are going to be the units that hold the chemical solution. You insert the transducer into them and soak them for a period of time. This example of gust unit is used to soak most of our regular transducers that we use daily with our machines, where this one is actually showing us how transesophageal transducers, ones that are inserted into the esophagus, are cleaned. There's also another option that we can use for our, our daily use transducers, and that is gonna be called a trophon unit. The trophon unit uses steamed hydrogen peroxide to clean the transducer. Due to increased regulations around the fluid soaking method of cleaning transducers, trophons are actually gaining quite a bit of popularity, but they are a little bit more expensive and they have been known to melt the glue that is used to make the transducers. Regardless of how you clean the transducer, you should always store it to avoid contamination after a high level disinfection. Autoclaving, which would result in sterilization of an item, requires extremely high temperatures and that'll definitely melt the glue that is used to make the transducer. So we typically don't sterilize our transducers, but prefer to perform a high level disinfection. We're worried again with autoclave that we might get to that curry point. However, most autoclave procedures only get up to about 250 degrees Fahrenheit, where curry point is more like 570 degrees. So the event is still low, but we don't wanna risk it. And we know that it's going to melt the glue. So we try to avoid those high temperature sterilizing procedures. If we need to use a transducer in a sterile procedure, like a biopsy or like a surgery, then we are going to cover them with a sterile probe cover, use sterile coupling gel, and then we will clean the transducer in that high level disinfection when we are done with the procedure. And that brings us to the end of Unit 8 Transducer Anatomy. Make sure to work through your workbook. You'll get more practice with working with the formulas that we learned in this unit, as well as understanding the implications of having backing material and being able to compare imaging transducers to continuous wave transducers. You'll also be able to review those nerd check questions that are open-ended questions that you can use to help you study the material that's been presented.